a day, one week before the NFL new league year starts. Things go bananas over at One Bills Drive with fan favorites released. There was shock. There was sadness. There's a lot of Bills fans that don't know what's coming up next, but all this has to do with getting ready for the 2024 NFL league year. I'm Kevin Carroll. Welcome to the Buffalo End Zone Podcast, everyone. And I'm John Scott. I'll start off by saying my mom critiqued me, Kevin, and said I've been dressing too casual on the podcast, so I decided to wear... uh, Dress like a lumberjack? Yes, uh, to uh, bring paper towels into here. Oh, uh, the Johnny... Not Bronny, Johnny (laughs) paper towels. Uh, And wear a collar and some buttons on here. But before we get started, also like, subscribe, comment, everything like that. Facebook, YouTube, all podcast platforms, because... Clearly, what in the world went down here, Kevin? I, I want to start the conversation because I've been here over 10 years covering this team. You've been here almost over twice that long in 22. the area. Where would you compare yesterday in terms of just craziness and shocking and all those things compared to the rest of your time here? 24 years in western New York. I've never seen anything like yesterday in my entire time here. I could go back to before I was even a sportscaster, but I've always followed sports. I don't remember this happening around any team that I can think of off the top of my head where you had such chaos and such shock and such the way it unfolded. You know, we could sit here and talk about, well, sometimes, you know, big news will come out or some news, blah, blah, blah. And maybe, you know, a few hours later I go back to – uh, when the Bills got Von Miller. You and I were in the middle of a podcast. We thought everything was done for the day, and we're settled in, and then that happens, and uh, whoever the tight end was, I can't remember at this point, John. But um, O.J. Howard. O.J. Howard. But, I mean, to see, like, every two minutes, a report from NFL Network, a report from Schefter at ESPN, a report from – another person who covers the Bills, all this stuff keeps unfolding, and then the Bills actually tweet out some of their roster moves, and it just keeps changing and evolving. And I think what was the last reported transaction or what the Bills were up was to? Was it like, Von Miller at, like, was 7, it 8? Was it Taylor Rapp at, like, 9 o'clock at night? or the, was The that Von be- Miller, I mean, whatever. I mean, yeah. we're talking, though— of like a five hour window here of it seemingly and especially that like three to five five of thirty range. Right around where, my bedtime. Where it was literally seeming like every five minutes or so you're refreshing X and it's like another one, another one, another one. And it it just was it was crazy. I, I mean to your point, in my ten years That sort of volume of transactions in short amount of time is unprecedented in my time. A lot of the moves I wouldn't call shocking. A lot of the moves we have discussed in some capacity as certainly possibilities. I think true. uh, But it was just, I think, that they all happened at once. (laughs) That you look at the totality of accolades and time spent with the organization and impact on the organization and even what their arrivals meant for the organization, especially at the top, you're thinking, it's it's like, oh, I want to let this person down easy, so I'm going to kind of sugarcoat it, maybe mm-hmm. draw it out a little bit. No, I mean, this was like Brandon Bean... I'm ripping off 17 Band-Aids at once. It's like that scene in 40-Year-Old Virgin where he's getting his back (laughs) waxed and you just hear Steve Carell screaming in the background. That's like what Bills fans were going through because it was, oh, man, Jordan Poyer, that one really hurts. That Brandon Bean's like, hold my beer. Here is Mitch Morse. Here is Tredavious White. And... It's just all of these things happening in such a short period of time. Again, it doesn't even allow you because fandom is so emotional. You're invested so emotionally to these players that there's an attachment that that I don't want to say mourning, but you need to go through your feelings and process 
losing them and, mm-hmm. and knowing they're no longer part of your favorite team and, and the rapid fireness of all of this transpiring on Wednesday. I don't think allowed it. it that was just, just like shock. That's where the shock was, I think. It wasn't the, oh, my God, I can't believe the Bills are, are cutting Jordan Poyer. I think it was, oh, my God, I can't believe they cut Jordan Poyer, and then they cut Mitch Morris, and then they're cutting Tredavious White. Oh, and we'll just throw in Deontay Hardy and Saran Neal and all of these other things all at once. That's where it was. It was wild to just kind of, you know, for, for our perspectives, sit on the couch and just keep keep scrolling through and text each other and, and throw our colleague Andy Young in the mix of, like, just – kind of our own little running dialogue of yeah this is madness another one and another another one and another one (laughs) dj Khaled, right (laughs) and you know a little inside on what we do if you cover the bills and you're in a working newsroom and stuff like that you get bought not bogged down but you start working on stuff and you're focused on something else and all you hear from across the newsroom is Bills did another. Bills did something else. And it's almost like being stuck in a riptide out in the ocean where you're swimming trying to make up ground, but you just can't because the information's coming in like a tidal wave, John. And I think some of the shock that some of Bills Mafia was posting on social media and stuff comes with where this Bills team is at right now. It's foreign territory after the drought for so long. I would assume some of the older uh, Bills fans who went through the Jim Kelly era knows when sometimes it's just time to move on and start to rebuild. When the Bills get Josh Allen and they're right in it and they're like, we're going for it now. You're like, all right, let's go for it now. When you don't get it when you go for it, eventually you're going to end up at this point at some time or the other. You know, we've all been wowed by how Brandon Bean has handled things, and I'm sure – you know, the way he's handling this, you got to give him credit for everything he's done so far. Man knows what he's doing. But I think it is to some fans out there who've never been through it with a winning team that just needs to get younger, that that was a lot of what the shock was just to people who are like, oh, I know Jordan Poyer. I like him. He's number 21. I know Mitch Morris. I hear from him after the game every now and then. But it's a business at the end of the day, and this was coming one way or the other. I'll give Joe Marino, who does the Locked on Bills podcast, a shout-out because he put out a tweet that I did not know this. Again, we, we discussed – I've been here 10 years. Mm-hmm. I've beefed up on my Bills history, but I did not realize that Bruce Smith, Thurman Thomas, and Andre Reed were all let go on the very same day <laughs> in 2000. So that certainly, I think – is the most comparable moment, and I would yeah. elevate it because those are three Hall of Famers. And I think Bruce and Andre went to the Washington football team and Thurman went to the Dolphins. Correct, but I'm just saying in terms of uh, – and, and obviously that transpired well before social media. Right. So the reaction and, and rapid fireness of, of yesterday – is something that we've never experienced before because while the moves of yesterday I, I would – not say at all as great as those players and impactful as they are are so nowhere close to the Bruce Smith Thurman Thomas right Andre Reed level of things so this organization has happened as you said the business side of it this was inevitable a- at some point Brandon Bean has done an incredible I, I would say almost magician-like maneuvering over the most recent years and off seasons of somehow managing the salary cap, continuing to improve the roster, and retain guys that at at points earlier in the offseason seemed incredibly improbable to bring back. So Matt Milano is one of those. Even Daryl Williams, even though it didn't really work out, Mm -hmm. that was one of them. There's other guys where you sit there, Jordan Poyer a year ago. It it was we were prepared for these guys as free agents to not – be around anymore and that's how they were able to keep their cap these notable names have for the most part not been part of the plan of hey we just have to cut them loose Harrison Phillips was one obviously Tremaine Edmonds last year but but beyond that I don't really think there's been super prominent guys that Brandon Bean has had to sit there and make a very hard call and say we can't keep this player. Mm-hmm. And 
a lot of it was just free agency. They're, they're, they outpriced themselves. In this instance, it was we, we just can't retain them. Mm-hmm. And I think it's inevitable when you're paying a quarterback as much money as you're paying Josh Allen, which is well worth it, but every team goes through this when they don't have the quarterback on the rookie wage right. and especially the caliber and level. You'll see it with Mahomes and – the Chiefs, ironically, they traded Tyreek Hill, and everyone thought they're done. They, I did. They, they had to make other decisions. Tyron Matthew left. They lost some other guys, had to retool their offensive line. They were able to keep Chris Jones, but even that's coming to a head right now. When you pay the quarterback that much money, everybody else, it, it's not as, as easy to do. This was coming. And I think, again, that's mm-hmm. why I say shocking with the actual moves themselves only one of them I'm going to put in that category, and we'll get to that in a little bit here. But the vast majority of them, I just think it was shocking because of, of the incredible timing of everything at once. Yeah, the timing and the names, John, and pick your poison from what you saw out there. It was basically leaders moving on, leaders of this team. So you have Jordan Poyer or Mitch Morse. We'll start with Poyer right there, who we thought, like you said, was gone a year ago. They bring him back in, uh, gets a two-year deal, um, but his name gets out there, and that's the first big reaction, John, And because now we're looking at the safeties that everyone has relied on for this Bills team that has made this turnaround and turned into this playoff team that's always there in the playoffs – was Jordan Poyer and Micah Hyde. We all, you called me out on this before. I assume Micah Hyde was gone. He's headed towards free agency. There's also rumors that he might just retire. So now you have Jordan Poyer released by the Bills. Micah Hyde's future with the team very much in doubt. So that leadership and those key guys on that back end of that defense, now we're looking at a whole new situation here. So just the financials. Overall, according to Spot Track, the releases cleared nearly twenty-six million dollars. Poyer's release, five point seven of that, right there. So the financial element of that. Jordan Poyer, Micah Hyde, and we'll get to him. Tredavious White are, are kind of the three poster childs, children mm-hmm. of the Sean McDermott new era of Bills successful contending football. And Tredavious, the number one draft pick, and, and Hyde and Poyer in tandem were basically the most notable first free agent additions and poor elevating into an all pro. And I've seen a lot of stuff outside of football, the impact that he's made. Certainly he's, he's been super outspoken and and getting into the community even more so in recent years since his sobriety and and being a, Mm -hmm. a speaker all across the area. It just last year, I know you asked the question, did it look like Hyde and Poyer had lost a step? I think there were some moments. Obviously, because of the injuries that they dealt with, mm-hmm. you saw Jordan as part of that three-safety look more in the box, and I think he was he was good at it. He's 33 years old. I, I mean, at some point, father time catches up. I do think he'll get on another team, and, and I think he still can contribute. This is one for me that, that I'll just say, and you understand this, we have, we're professionals, we have a job to do, but I've been in that locker room almost every single day since Jordan Poyer got here in 2017 mm-hmm. and have developed a relationship myself that goes beyond just reporter and player. And so this is one that I, I had prepared myself a year ago to, to not see him, and, and then obviously he came back here. But uh, I recognize the, the lost fans feel from afar, and, and I and I totally get it. And this is someone that, yeah, in my tenure, even in my career of 17-plus years of just being around athletes, this is one that I've gotten pretty close to. So on a personal level, it sucks, but I don't think his career's over. I still think there's more out there. And I and I completely understand the business side of this for the Buffalo Bills. Again, I just think it's more of, a, of an inevitability that most fans knew was coming at some point. It has to for everyone, uh-huh. but – it's it's the stark reality that that time is now. The other name that this was actually a legit shock to me because we've 
talked about it. We talked about it at the end of the season. We talked about it before the bracket podcast that we did before all hell broke loose earlier in the day with Ryan Bates now off to Chicago and Mitch Morse is there, or are you going to depend on some rookie to come in or someone else to play center if Mitch Morse isn't healthy? And Mitch Morse is healthy, and they released him, a guy who at the end of the season when it was up in the air, is this it for Mitch Morse? He said, no, I, I want to be here. And I didn't even – the thought never even crossed my mind that Mitch Morse would get released. So that was the one that took me by surprise. Yeah, if you're going to use the word shocking, it was this one. Yeah. And any conversations around Mitch Morse's future with the Bills was usually and almost exclusively on is he going to retire? That's always been the conversation with him because of his history with concussions and things like that. But he was taken back by the question of, Will he be back next year? Because it was not in his mind space mm-hmm. after the season. Eight point five million. I mean, that's a lot of money for a team that starting yesterday was forty plus over the salary cap. Eight and a half. And Morse is a good player. We understand his leadership and, and the impact that he has on that offensive line. Talk to someone like Eric Wood and, and others just knowledgeable about the importance of a center amongst the offensive line and the offense as a whole. Morse was a great, great addition for him. They paid him pretty well when they when they got him from the Kansas City Chiefs to solidify a spot that was abruptly vacated by Eric Wood because of his career-ending injury. This one is shocking, and I think it's shocking by itself because you just didn't see it coming. And then to piggyback off of your point, it's shocking because our conversation about the Ryan Bates trade was – well, maybe they'll just groom someone to be the backup that can slide into the, the starting job when Mitch Morse is probably gone after next season. So the Bills then get rid of their starter, get rid of their main guy on the back end, the, the backups yeah. in Ryan Bates, who was getting paid a salary that indicated he'd be a starter. That's when they signed him. And now it's like, well, what are they going to do? Well, there's reports out there that recently restructured Connor McGovern is now going to slide to center, and then yesterday in the back end kind of a lower-level thing is they they bring back David Edwards to a two-year deal, and they're going to have him slotted in as of now at guard. Mm -hmm. And, okay, this then maybe more so brings into play drafting an offensive lineman on the interior maybe as high as day two. It, that that's where mine went to immediately because we talk about getting younger in these rookie deals. And immediately, if uh, Morse is gone, and then you slide McGovern into center, and you do all this that the report is out there, immediately I'm like, well, now we're looking at you need a defensive tackle, wide receiver, and now you really should be thinking offensive line up there in that top three. Um, you know, a, a day two pick to me. Well, and that continues to go counter to all of these people who think it's it's almost adding a hole is what it's really doing because all I all I and a lot of people are for, like wide receivers obviously at the top of the list early mm-hmm. in the draft, but then certainly you knew it was going to be one. It appears probably both safeties are going to need to be replaced, though they bring back Taylor Rapp, and then you. Then you have defensive line has to be addressed. And now now it's the interior. I mean, the interior is important. And I'll, I'll never forget the question where Deion Dawkins finally realized that I had shaved my head in training camp <laughs> was asking him about having all of this constant rotation at left guard. And he had mentioned never in his time, in his career, since joining the Bills in 2017, <laughs> has he gone from one season to the next having the, the same person playing left guard next to him. Well, after this past season, like all five guys were healthy. It was the best the offensive line's been in years. Cool. It looks like this is going to be solidified. And now David Edwards looks like he's about to be the eighth guy that Deion Dawkins has played next to (laughs) as a starter to start the season. And if it's not David Edwards, some rookie. I I mean, I I suppose it's possible – Something crazy could happen because we know they love to jumble up the offensive line in training camp, and maybe they get great value on a center. 
and the rookie comes in and plays center. They kick McGovern to guard, back to guard, and whatever. But um, that's just such a, an interesting anecdote of how solid and set it and forget it Deion Dawkins has been. The absolute turnstile from Richie Incognito to the present there's been at left guard. That's going to end up being a trivia question one day to name all of the guards that started next ne- to <laughs> next to Deion Dawkins. I wonder if Deion Dawkins could even answer that question. That's a good question for the offseason. Yeah, I'll have to right? ask him. Kid, do you remember all of them? Uh, the other thing, and you, the reports are out there, you have it confirmed, John, on the situation with Tredavious White, which we talked about the possibility or the likelihood that th- this is probably – time for the Bills to move on from Tredavious White with the injury situations and you know he's great but I'll you have to admit it and he'll end up somewhere John um I would assume a team is not going to risk giving him a big deal to go there but that one not really a shocker to me but it has that June post June 1st thing which I think a lot of people need to understand how that is going to impact things and what that means. And the only way that I really am seeing it, I'm reading Spot Track. Mike Gennetti makes it a great article about all of these moves. The timing makes sense. He clears about $10.2 million in cap space. Mm-hmm. June, July, it's when you sign your draft class. So you basically it. look at the money that Tredavious White – his release will be giving Brandon Bean to deal with. It's not necessarily going to be, oh, well, let's sign Leonard Floyd for $10 million like they did in late May, early June. It probably is more towards let's sign our draft class, and that's the money that we say we don't have to keep as we navigate free agency. We just know it's coming down the road right. to, to do that. The dead cap with Trey, 6.2 this year, 4.1 in 2025 again making this a post june 1st decision we have discussed it and and i was on the fence of it's going to happen mm-hmm. and then when i did the round table with joe biscaglia sal capaccio and matt perino perino texted me yesterday because he was adamant trey's going to get cut and he told me to find the clip and post it so everyone <laughs> saw it because isn't he at disney world yeah, enjoy it's like a 10-day trip with his family <laughs> and he's still podcast i told him focus on mickey uh but joe and sal were in the camp of they weren't they, he, they didn't think that they were going to get rid of trey this was probably a tough decision for them one for the person the player i mean you talk about Jordan and Micah being kind of at the top of the list. I mean, Tredavious White is the first draft pick under Sean McDermott, Brandon Bean not part of that draft, and he was so good, so instantaneously. The big interception in Kansas City that Mm -hmm. year when they were in the midst of that losing streak, and he's just been such a fun-loving personality and things like that. But two major injuries at that cap number, when you already have then Rasul Douglas and Christian Benford, and you're going to continue to wait to try to figure out if Kyrie Elam's going to pan out as well. Right. There's just not room to roll the dice on a guy as important and, and love, beloved as he is amongst the organization to do that, especially when you got to make tough decisions. And $10 million in cap space is a lot of money for a team that has none at this point in time. So this is another one that you know you feel for – Trey, it's a tough one. He'll fondly be remembered by people, and and I love some of the clips. I even put one out of him working with uh, former defensive backs coach John Butler's kid at training camp last right, year, yeah. and, and and working with him. It, that's just that's the type of guy. And, and again, I think that's where a lot of fans are going to. And, and you talk about culture, and it's such a, like a taboo thing to talk about, but. I think that's what also makes this such a challenging 24 hours for Bills fans is they were good, fun people to root for, and certainly Tredavious falls into that bucket. Everyone remembers Trey 
picking up the play sheet <laughs> that blew out onto the field and holding it up in the air like like you can't not forget that and it's just right and there's no them. way he actually read anything he just right. was doing it was like a charade of sorts yeah it, it was a riot it still it stands the test of time dancing in the snow game yeah, yeah. I, I mean Going up to you at the beginning of training camp wouldn't do interviews, but he'll shoot the breeze with you walking to the cafeteria. And, and he was a, a fun guy to be around, obviously. Yeah, I another one that, again, I'd been in the room almost every day since he got here in 2017. And big big fan of Trey, big fan of a lot of these guys, and, and wish them all the best. And like we said off the top, I mean, these are just inevitable tough decisions and – We'll probably hear from Brandon Bean maybe a week or so after training camp, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I wouldn't expect massive additions, so I think maybe the subtractions will be the, the main talking point to get his reaction. And, and he's a pretty straightforward, open book who wears his emotions on his sleeve. And, and I bet discussing some of these moves, especially with these three guys we've started yeah. with at the top, it is you'll see it and read it off of his body language, his tone and the way he speaks about them, that this was tough. Some of them like poor or boy, Hyde and Poyer, yeah. they were discussed and, and their, their, their answers were kind of almost making it seem like this was inevitable. Morse and Tredavious um, weren't. So I, I think it, it'll be. Interesting to, to see their thought process of exactly what led them to, to finally have to, to make these these really hard choices. Did, did the choice become easier with what you got out of Rasul Douglas? 100%. 100%. You know? And one of the— th Who's one, what? One of our polls a better pickup than Drew Bledsoe. That's true. That is what happened. The— Rasul Douglas is someone who restructured his deal yesterday. That was kind of like— I've, I think that was one of the things that kicked things off was, oh, Rasul Douglas restructured to save them 2.5. We had discussed maybe an extension for Douglas mm -hmm. to save some money. They're choosing to go with the restructure, and I 100% agree. I mean, he was, I think, the greatest midseason addition Brandon Bean has made, and it's arguably, if we're going just, hey, you acquired this player – Outside of Stephon Diggs, I think that's that's the golden goose for what Brandon Bean has yeah. done in acquiring a player. And, again, I don't want to sleep on this. I know he's such a hot topic. Even one of my buddies who's a Bills fan who lives in Atlanta was going at it with me earlier in the week about Kyrie Elam. Like, they're, they're not giving up on him. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's why they chose restructure as opposed to re-sign or, or extend for Rasul Douglas because – they want to see if year three is the year they can finally get the return on investment on their former first-round pick. Of course, the big money move involves Von Miller renegotiating his deal. Um, the edge rusher coming off injury, didn't have the best performance when he came back, actually was sad a game, John, but the Bills and the big-time acquisition from a few years ago – do a little work together and help out on the cap uh, numbers-wise. Maybe shocky number two okay. is, is what I would say because this is Von Miller just doing a solid for the team. And I'm not saying it's shocking because he's a bad dude, but who the heck is, as even regardless of how much money you've made in your career, I mean, giving up eight, nine million dollars voluntarily is unheard of. Mm-hmm. It's unheard of, especially for a guy who doesn't have maybe such an extensive history. I'm not saying Brady or some of these guys. They, they took team-friendly deals at, at times throughout their career, but just voluntarily in the midst of a deal already written up to say, hey, I'm going to do this, it, it is a humongous win for the Bills because saving $8.6 million in cap space without having to lose anyone – and commit to Von Miller even longer than they need to, it, it, it's like a get-out-of-jail-free card for Brandon Bean when he has like $5 left in the game of Monopoly and is about to go broke and be out. I, I mean, that's, that's kind of where I look at it of th this is the, the life jacket that he, he desperately needed 
to stop the bleeding. And, and so uh, a, a great thing, and this is one I, I'll be curious to hear Von Miller's reasoning behind this. My assumption on face value is I want to win. And if we have to keep cutting guys, like the Bills can't get out of the Von Miller contract. So Von Miller's like, hey, I still want to win. I still want to chase a title. And our chances continuing to diminish the more guys that he has to get rid of to become cap compliant. So let me just do this and, and get us out of it. And now it's all incentives based. Mm -hmm. So it, it's which is good. <laughs> well, right. If you end you up pay, if you end <laughs> right. up paying Vaughn the full twenty like he originally was going to get, something th good happens. Yeah. <laughs> then you're finally getting the return on investment that has uh, eluded them the first two years because largely because of the knee injury. This this was shocking and, and critical, I would say, to the Bills in totality trying to put this roster and retool things. The head of our newsroom just texted me, you think he doesn't know we're doing a podcast right now? He's right down the hall. At any rate, you talk yeah. about Vaughn Miller. Uh, Josh Allen, we talked about it. The other big name, that you mentioned Tom Brady and other quarterbacks taking team-friendly deals and renegotiating and reworking things. We talked that that's likely coming down the road. Allen partying over in Europe or wherever uh, right now. But is that, you think, as we record this, it hasn't happened yet, the next shoe to drop when it comes to uh, approaching next Wednesday when the new league year starts as far as getting to where they need to be? Yeah, I think I saw someone say, basically, with all the moves the Bills made yesterday after they do a Josh Allen restructure, boom, they're cap compliant. Good to go. Um, and maybe that's why, in terms of being prepared for the start of the tampering period next week, Brandon Bean's like, I just I'm gonna do it all at once. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and got all of the all of the deals done to get under the cap. Allen being the next one, almost like a foregone conclusion. And then maybe they maneuver one other thing or something like that to, to see where they can get to me. I don't think it once they get through all of the, the rest of these and yeah, they cut Deontay Hardy. They, we I had already mentioned uh, Naheem Hines, Saran Neal, like the, they do these other things. I, I'm not, I don't think they're going to eventually be able to get to a number where it's like, Hey, we could spend more money now. I, I don't know if they're going to get there or that'll yeah. be their plan. Um, but maybe, with a few more tweaks here that they could be a little more flexible in free agency than we originally thought. Yeah. Uh, you just got to the other players that are released, John. Um, we'll kind of start to wrap things up here. Signed by the Bills, punter Matt. I'm going to screw this up. Hawk. Uh, Hawk. Um, back to compete for the punter job in – also, the guy who holds the football for Tyler Bass. Right. And Sam Martin had good moments, had some bad moments. Um, so we'll see. It looks like, uh, speaking of Joe Biscalia, Punter Palooza is his favorite part of training camp. <laughs> it, it, that might be back here. Um, and then they bring back Mitchell Trubisky, two-year deal reportedly, which when we discussed briefly, because there wasn't much to talk about, the quarterbacks and the state of the quarterback position with the Bills, backup was, was an intriguing thing. We went mm -hmm. through the whole dialogue of how this past season across the league showed the value and importance of a, a competent and above average guy that you can slide in there to save your season for two to four games should your star quarterback get hurt. That didn't happen for certain teams, and, and it kind of – torpedoed their, mm -hmm. their aspirations because their stars got hurt Trubisky I don't know if he's that guy uh, I think I'm fine and comfortable saying it's a upgrade I I'm not going to gauge how much from Kyle Allen but I do like it's a two-year deal of course as we saw yesterday two-year deals don't mean anything right. it could be a two-year <laughs> that they can get out in one but I would like some stability at that position behind Josh Allen, and maybe Trubisky could be that guy. Yeah, and the fact that he's been in the system before. I remember when he was here, 
uh, during preseason games, a lot of crap thrown at him. But the response was always, well, he's new to the system. Now he's more familiar with it uh, as a backup to Josh Allen. And uh, I don't know. He won't be number 10 because that's Khalil Shakir. So, but yeah, so he's back in the in the fold, which I think is fine. I, and, and then I don't, I'm not going to say this is shocking. It, it was it did not. I'm not even going to say, I guess, surprising. After the Poyer release, it's like, oh, shoot, what are they going to do with safety? They, they bring back Taylor Rapp, and I know the number is like 3 for 14 reportedly. I agree with those out there saying, don't look at it at face value. I mean, we understand contract structuring and, and caps and outs and things like that. I, I would be very surprised if the Bills were willing to commit four-plus million a year to Taylor Rapp, strictly off of especially once what they saw last year. Mm-hmm. Um Maybe he'll find a more suitable, comfortable position in a year into the system. He he can play better at the safety spot. I, I know a lot of people have felt that he kind of struggled, especially early on. But people were also at this time a year ago when he got signed, super excited, and were like, "Oh, well, the Bills have three starting caliber safeties." So I was. Um, we'll see how that turns out. But at least now you know they have one spot filled at the safety spot and whether or not we're, we're presuming Micah Hyde, whether it's retiring or just isn't re-signed is gone. Now you got to find another one. And that's maybe where you invest in the draft. Although the safety market in free agency is incredibly robust and more veterans are just getting released. Now, if the bills aren't willing to pay Jordan Poyer, I don't know if the veteran route to fill him or Micah Hyde shoes is going to, be in the budget, but there are options out there. Draft someone and have them compete with Demar Hamlin, right? I mean, at this point, I, I mean, we've discussed previously the possibility of Demar Hamlin getting released. Right. Um, maybe that's more of a training camp battle, and you bring in some undrafted guys or whatever, and see how it shakes out. There's also a numbers game, right? And at the very least, if Demar is fourth safety which he's been at times and is core special teamer when you lose a guy like Saran Neal right maybe that's that's the new role that he kind of fills in so what are we looking at down the road here John because we're now less than a week away from the new league year starting you have a bat crap crazy day on a Wednesday do we see things pretty much quieting down if the Josh Allen thing gets done until the new league year hits? I would guess. I, I mean, honestly, I don't – like I said, maybe there's Josh Allen and maybe another restructure or yeah. something like that. But in terms of trimming – I don't want to say trimming fat, but trimming salaries and, mm-hmm. and trimming the roster in that capacity, I, I just don't know where else you go. I, I just right. – th- there aren't really any other numbers out there that you could go. The only other thing – and this, again, would be right around the, the – tampering period starting is if beans got another big move in them in the trade market yeah in, in whatever capacity that is and if it's hey let's not roll the dice in the draft let's see if we can fill one of these important holes with a known commodity and fire one of our 11 draft picks mm-hmm. to do so Maybe, but then again, you're you're paying that guy, and, and they're looking to get younger and cheaper, which was a, a as clear of an indicator yesterday as anything else. Before yesterday unfolded, John, we had already done a podcast that you and I had discussed about uh, since it's March and Mar- March Madness and brackets and stuff like that. So we did already record. I was actually going to tell you. Uh, at the start of this, should we bracket the players who were released yesterday? Mm-hmm. But uh, that wouldn't make sense, John. But, yeah, we do have uh, other podcasts out there. But, of course, we'll keep you updated on any news that happens, especially when things start to heat up. But these bracket podcasts that we were looking at are actually pretty fun and pretty interesting, uh, especially what you were telling me about Rasul Douglas. Yeah, I, before the, the madness yesterday, we recorded the podcast, which you could find YouTube and, and podcast platforms and whatnot. And, and check it out because I we went through 16 people who we kind of put in the bucket of the, the best players the Bills have directly traded for. 
for all the actual specifics of the criteria. You can listen. Um, but I put it out there on, on X for people to vote as well. And a lot of it was chalk. The only one that wasn't is, is people felt Rasul Douglas was a better acquisition That's still than amazing. Drew Bledsoe was, um, which you and I both disagreed with. We're going to end up doing best free agent editions next week. And then, you know, the week or so after that, best Bills draft picks of all time. Before, though, we wrap up this one, because I think this is the natural – Next question coming out of yesterday is where does this leave the Bills right now in terms of their standing in the AFC, their place in the pantheon of teams as a contender? Can they still, without knowing how they operate free agency of the draft, can they still be a Super Bowl contender and surpass the disappointing finishes that they've had the past few years. As long as you have Josh Allen, Stefan Diggs is still there. Um, there is, despite the veteran leadership that lost, there are leaders still on the team that have gone through this already. And I think, that, like I said off the top, winners have to go through this. But as long as you have that core – you should be okay to battle your way through this. So while we sit here right now before you get to free agency and you get to the draft, I would still have the Bills atop the AFC East right now and still in the mix as a team that's going to be competing uh, into the playoffs just as we sit here right now. A couple years ago, as I alluded to and I mentioned and referenced this earlier, the Chiefs traded – Tyreek Hill, after was it even after the year they got pummeled by Tampa, or was it the year they didn't even make the the Super Bowl and the Bengals did? I think. Yeah, I think that's the year. That was and, a thirteen second it, loss. Year. Yes, and it's like, oh, the the Chiefs don't have any wide receivers. What are they going to do? They lost all these offensive linemen that wasn't even good before, and they've won two Super Bowls in that window since, quote unquote, entering the retooling down point right theirs and and their defense has carried the torch especially this past year and so of course is Patrick Mahomes I mean the stars that were left on the team Patrick Mahomes Travis Kelsey Chris Jones and then Ladarius Sneed mm -hmm. Ladarius Sneed excuse me elevates and they hit on Trent McDuffie and it's just it looks different than it did maybe when when they first started this run that they're on I agree with the if you have Josh Allen, anything can happen. Yeah. And I don't think the cupboards is bare as maybe it could feel because the names aren't as robust and notable as have been in the past. But I do think that the margin for error is so much smaller now for Brandon Bean. Mm -hmm. When you're doing these sort of transitional moves and it's kind of moving to a new look, new era of iteration of this Josh Allen Bills team, you can't miss on a first-round pick like Kyrie Elam has to this point. You have to have contributions like you did a year ago from Dalton Kincaid, your first-round pick, Osiris Torrance, your second-round pick, I don't know if you have the luxury of using a third-round pick for a guy that, at this point in time, looks like a backup for mm -hmm. his entire time there. They've found ways to – we see Terrell Bernard from two years ago. What a great pickup. It didn't seem that way. But yeah. do they have the pace – do they have the luxury of patience with first, second, third-round picks the way that they have had the past couple of years where James Cook was rotating at first with – Devin Singletary, and then he becomes a pro bowler in year two. I, I feel like if the Bills want to stay as a division contender and king and Super Bowl contender, they can't have the one-year grace period with these young guys, one two-year grace period with the draft picks. They need them to hit, and I think they need to hit even bigger than what Dalton Kincaid did and some others. 100%. I think – we talk about that wide receiver train, John. You have the 11 picks right now. Uh, now, to me, is the time to get the most explosive guy you can get 
to help the offense put up big numbers. And that's where Josh Allen comes in. And that's the key to getting through this semi-rebuild that they're going through is by riding Josh Allen and powering through it. Which is ironic because hasn't all of the talk for years been, what can we do to take more off of Josh Allen's plate? (laughs) And that's just not the reality, I think, in general when you have, uh uh-oh, when you have... Time to go. (laughs) When you have a quarterback that's a superstar, all-worldly talent like Allen, Mahomes, like you, you don't... I think this it's a misnomer to say we need to take more off their plate. No, I want them driving the car 90% of the time because they're the best players on the planet. It, it's just, again, I, I think – and Brandon Bean said it with the money at the end of the season. Like, if he's spending three mil, three mil has to be spent wisely and hit. Like, yeah. Deontay Hardy misses can't happen. Trent Sherfield misses can't happen. I just think the margin for error this offseason in particular is is very fine – and we'll see what happens and what the books look like after these sorts of moves going into 25. You just hit particular. You sounded like Donald Trump for a second. In particular. (laughs) John, the bigger shock yesterday, though. Before we go, we always talk about what you're watching, John. Uh, (laughs) The bigger news was yours truly making his Netflix debut yesterday. With all the Bills news breaking, I never got a chance to watch the start of season two of Full Swing. But this guy right here at Oak Hill press conference, now a Netflix superstar. Well, welcome to the party, pal. Because (laughs) I was all over when Jesse Pagula visited the Bills. That's true. (laughs) And I got screenshot pictures from all of my friends of... Me standing in the backdrop as as Jesse's talking with Sean McDermott and some others on the next Netflix version for tennis. So, uh, all right. Once again, you're you're a step or two behind me. That's the story of my life, my man. <laughs> well, it's usually like step six, or two behind you in golf. Yeah, no, that, I'd say I was to say that's like six strokes or so, <laughs> six to eight strokes behind me in golf. <laughs> All right. Uh, More to come, I'm sure, with the Bills. John and I will be back here again next week. Get you up to date on all the latest news around the Bills. We'll have uh, another one of the Bracket podcasts for you as March rolls along. As always, everyone, thanks for joining us.